Hello, and welcome to Chapter 2, Investments in Equity Securities. Chapter 2 is really an excellent introduction to much of the remainder of the course, all the way up to Chapter 9. Just a reminder that the slides are the property of McGraw-Hill Education, unless indicated otherwise, and the audio is the property of myself, Els Grek. We'll be covering all the learning objectives in this chapter, including learning objective four, five, and six. However, I'll be covering them in multiple videos. Again, this chapter is really critical as it sets the stage for all the chapters up to and including chapter nine. I'm going to start with learning objective one, how to report equity investments, both historically and now. I want to clarify the purpose of my lecture videos. They are not a substitute to reading the textbook. What I'm really doing is I'm highlighting the important points from the textbook, but it's critical that after you watch the videos, you also read the textbook. In addition, there is no substitute to writing practice questions under exam conditions. And in accounting, just like a lot of other disciplines, the act of practicing under exam conditions really allows for learning, your learning. It starts with you learning a brand new concept. So if I lecture on something, that's learning a brand new concept. You then need to write a new question, not a question that I've already solved for you, a brand new question under exam condition. And that means without the help of a textbook or your notes or Google or GPT chat or anything, but what you would be allowed in an exam. So for instance, if you're writing a paper exam with only a calculator allowed, then you need to write your practice questions on paper with only the allowed calculator. If you're going to write the exam on Excel and you're going to have the handbook, then you should write your practice questions on Excel with the handbook. No other aids. Then you need to compare your answer to the solution. And that's so that you can correct your misconceptions. At this point, the best thing you could do is to correct your answers, to physically correct them. If I'm doing it on paper, I often do this with a different color pen, or if I'm doing it on Excel, I'll change the color of my font, but you want to physically correct your incorrect original answer. And then jump back and write another practice question, particularly if this is a difficult concept. So I would say if you didn't get let's say 80 or 90% of your question correct when you compared it to a solution, you need to write an additional practice question under exam conditions. And you need to keep moving through these last three steps until you feel confident that you understand the concept before moving to the next new concept and starting the circle all over again. My lecture videos are the starting point, not the ending point. Remember that there is no substitute to reading the textbook and working through practice questions under exam conditions. I just want to make that clear before we move on. So what are equity investments? It's when one corporation owns the shares of another corporation. The corporations, both the investor who is buying the shares, and the investee who is selling the shares. And when I say the investee is selling the shares, it may not be that the investee has sold the shares directly to the investor. It may be that the investor has actually gone onto the open market and purchased the shares in the open market. In that case, that those shares that they're purchasing, we would still call that corporation's shares that have been purchased, we would still call them the investee. And keep in mind, both corporations can either be public corporations or private corporations. Just so you know, private corporations, they sell shares. Like they, they do have shares, they, they have share capital. So it is possible for another corporation to buy a private corporation's shares. It's just not on the open market, that's all. An example of one corporation owning the shares of another corporation, let's say ABC Corporation purchases the shares of Royal Bank of Canada, RBC for short. Remember, equity investments are reported as assets on the investor's statement of financial position. So the key question we need to answer is how should a Canadian corporation report 
in its financial statements an equity investment, an investment in the shares of another corporation. Equity investments are divided into two main categories. Non-strategic equity investments, also called passive investments, and strategic equity investments. So let's explore what those two categories mean. A non-strategic or passive investment is when the investor corporation does not have an active role in the operations of the investees corporation. The focus of the investor is simply to get a reasonable rate of return until the cash is really needed for other purposes. They basically don't own enough shares to influence the operations of the investee in any way. A good example would be that RBC. So currently, RBC has, as of August 2023, 1,388,388,000 shares outstanding. Even if an investor corporation purchased 1% of those shares, they would not be able to influence the operations of RBC. An investment of 1% would be, therefore, categorized as a non-strategic or passive investment. A strategic equity investment is when the investor corporation has enough share ownership that they can actually influence the strategic decisions of the investee. So what does that mean? You know, they, they can influence the strategic decisions. It means that they have influence over the operating, investing, and financing decisions of the investee. In fact, the investor will purchase enough shares because they actually want to establish or maintain a long-term operating relationship with the investee corporation. Depending on the level of ownership, the investor corporation may have either full control, joint control, or significant influence. I'm going to describe all those things in later videos. So now, how are equity investments, strategic or non-strategic, reported? We're going to start by looking at how non-strategic or passive investments are recorded and reported. First, let's quickly look at the history with regards to passive or non-strategic investments. How were they reported in the past? Because it's changed a lot over the years. Prior to 2005, passive investments were reported at generally some cost-based amount. They were written down if they were impaired in value, but passive investments were never written up. Instead, gains were recognized only when the passive investment was sold. Then in 2005, IAS 39 was introduced for non-strategic investments. For the first time, non-strategic investment, passive investments could be valued at fair value. However, there were problems with IAS 39 in that the gains and losses from passive investments could be reported either through the income statement or through a brand new category of income called Other Comprehensive Income or OCI. Over time, users and preparers really thought that the financial statements were getting way too complicated with regards to passive investments. That IAS 39 basically was difficult to understand, apply, and really hard to interpret. So IFRS 9, Financial Instruments Classification and Measurement, was created, and it came into effect on January 1st, 2018. It totally replaced IAS 39. Under IFRS 9, all non-strategic investments had to be reported at fair value, including investments in private corporations. The focus was on providing improved and useful decision-making information about equity investments for users of the financial statements. Really, it was to simplify the accounting as well as improve comparability between financial statements. In addition, in 2011, IFRS 13, Fair Value Measurement, was introduced, and it provided really a single, unified definition of fair value, and it provided a framework for measuring it. It also details the required disclosures about fair value measurement. 
So there's now guidance on non-strategic passive investments regarding reporting them at fair value, and there's guidance about what fair value is. Now, just so you know, fair value is defined as the price that would be received if the asset was sold or the price paid to transfer a liability if the parties to the transaction are at arm's length at the measurement date. So what does arm's length transaction mean? It refers to a business deal in which both the buyer and the seller act independently. So the parties do not influence each other. It's assumed that there's no relationship between them and one party cannot influence anything about the other party. Arm's length transactions are really saying that both parties are acting in their own self-interest and they're not subject to any pressure from the other party. That's the definition of fair value. Okay, so how are non-strategic and strategic equity investments reported under IFRS? Note that I'm specifically addressing how equity investments are recorded and reported under IFRS. Right now, I'm ignoring ASPE. It depends on whether the equity investment is categorized as a strategic investment or a non-strategic slash passive investment. First, all passive investments in equity shares are immediately classified as fair value through profit or loss. In that case, the unrealized and realized gains and losses are reported through the income statement. So keep in mind, all passive investments, all non-strategic investments in equity shares are automatically classified as fair value through P&L. This is a default method to report passive investments. However, investors are permitted to make an irrevocable election at the date of purchase to instead classify their non-strategic investment as fair value through other comprehensive income. In that case, all of the unrealized and realized gains and losses flow through other comprehensive income. Note that this method is only permitted if the investor makes an irrevocable election at the date the shares are purchased. If they don't make this irrevocable election, the investment in equity shares will automatically be reported as fair value through profit or loss. Note that we'll be covering the reporting under both of these methods in this chapter, chapter two. For strategic investments, the reporting method is dependent on the level of investment. There are three general levels of investment. First, we have significant influence for which the equity method must be used. We'll be covering the equity method for significant influence strategic investments in this chapter, also chapter two. When the investment is large enough to indicate that the investor has control, then the strategic investment is reported using consolidation. We'll be covering consolidations from chapter three to chapter eight. Finally, we have a strategic investment called joint control. Joint control is divided into two subcategories, joint venture and joint operations. Both require different reporting methods. Joint operations require proportionate consolidation. Joint ventures require the use of the equity method, the same as significant influence investments. We'll not be covering joint control until chapter nine, so it's not something you have to worry about right now. So, how do we decide if an investment is a strategic investment or a non-strategic investment? Because there's, there's huge differences between how we report and record these two types of investments. So how do we determine whether an investment is a non-strategic investment or a strategic investment? IFRS 9 limits its scope to non-strategic investments by specifically exempting strategic investments, investments with significant influence control or joint control. So IFRS 9 actually says we do not apply to strategic investments. Great. What IFRS 9 does not do is provide any guidance as to when an equity investment is a passive investment, is a non-strategic investment. So how will you know if an investment is a passive slash non-strategic investment? 
non-strategic investments are a default category. So what does that mean? It means that you need to review the investment. And if it is not a strategic investment, if it is not with control or joint control or significant influence, it is automatically determined to be a non-strategic investment and therefore falls under the scope of IFRS 9. So this is kind of a backwards thing here. We've got to look at every investment and say, is it control? Nope. Okay. Is it joint control? Nope. Oh, is it significant influence? Nope. Oh, then it's a non-strategic investment. That seems to be a little bit confusing, but let's just look at a decision tree in order to determine if an investment is a non-strategic slash passive investment. Start by determining if the investor has control or joint control. So we're going to look at every investment and we're going to say, hey, does it meet the definition of control? No. Okay. Does it meet the definition of joint control? No. If the answer is no to both of those things, then we have to review the investment and determine whether the investor has the ability to participate in the strategic decisions of the investee. We're going to try and figure out, is there a significant influence? Do they have the ability to make decisions about the operating, investing, and financing operations of the investee? Well, if the answer to this is now no, then the investment is a non-strategic investment and you have to apply IFRS 9. So remember, IFRS 9 is a default category. It applies to all investments that do not involve control, joint control, or significant influence. Remember, the most important thing is to first categorize the investment into either strategic or non-strategic. And we can only do that if we look at the investment and say no to all the strategic investments. Strategic and non-strategic investments are reported very differently. And it's really important to first categorize the investment as one or the other so that you're sure you'll be recording them appropriately.